and welcome. We are live on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of the platforms that I could successfully hit. Thank you for joining me. My name is Terry Vaughan of TV Empowers, and we have spent a lot of time recently talking about how to be great in front of a camera, and it's been fantastic. But I, I made the mistake the other day of jumping across and watching a news, news report that essentially confirm that even though we're in the middle of a pandemic, criminals have not stopped getting up to no good, which inspired me to want to go back to my roots and to deliver some personal safety advice here to help you avoid potentially getting into harm's way if you possibly can. Everything we're going to cover today is going to by being able to identify a possible threat before an attack happens based on either nonverbals, body language, or environmental considerations. If you can learn how to read your environment and the people in it eff efficiently, you can put yourself in a position to keep yourself safe from probably 70, 80, maybe even 90% of all the threats you're ever likely to face. And that's what I want to ultimately cover today. Now, I'm going to be looking in a variety of different places because I've got monitors, cameras, lighting, notes, and all these things. So when I'm not looking at the camera, that's where I'm at. One of the things I think that happens to most people when we start talking about personal safety is there's a fear factor that comes in. And oftentimes that fear is linked to that which we don't feel like we either understand or are able to predict. It's a fear of the unknown. And fear is detrimental overall to your ability to do the one thing that I want you to start doing if you're not already doing it. And that's to scan, to be alert, and to pay attention to what's going on within your environment. Fear ultimately is detrimental to your ability to do those things, to scan and be attentive, because it hijacks so much of the valuable cognitive resources that could be allocated to those aforementioned habits. Fear eats away at you. And the thing is with is this, when, we're, when we fear what we don't know, we tend to want to either ignore it or go full tilt paranoia to the degree that we're not doing anything useful. With paranoia, it's erratic, it's unpredictable, and it doesn't help. What we want and what I want for you is to be somewhere in the middle where you adopt a a group or a cluster of good habits that will help insulate you from most of the things you're ever likely to face, but you do them all the time because being safe is about applying lots of little new habits rather than hitting one big thing and then saying, okay, now I'm good. I'm always going to be safe because that's very rarely the case. It's really lots of little things applied habitually that provide concentric rings of protection. But first we have to get you past the sense that you can't predict what's going to happen and the fear that comes along with the unknown. Because if you can manage your fear, if you can control that emotion, then you're more likely to be able to manage and take on board all the lessons you need in order to identify a problem before it even hits you. So before I jump into this, I want to say hi and jump across to the chat. Say hi to those that are in here. Appreciate you showing up today. It'll be lonely without you. And if you have any questions on personal safety as we go through this, please feel free to throw them up in the chat. I'll do my best to keep jumping backwards and forwards to answer those questions if possible. If I'm going to answer them and I know with some of the stuff that we've got coming up, I might answer some of them, then I'll say, hey, it's coming and we'll scoot right along and keep on trucking. The thing is with fear is this. If you understand what it is, you should be looking for, if you understand how to scan, your fear should decrease. There'll be plenty of time if something were to happen for fear to rear its ugly head. But first, we need to control what might be anxiety rather than necessarily fear over thinking about staying safe. And one way to combat your fear is to, instead of focusing on what could potentially be the aftermath of some sort of an incident or an attack, instead of focusing on the consequences of, of living through something like that, instead I want you to focus on your ability 
to put in place some steps, some habits that will help insulate you from those things. Being alert and scanning alone, if that's all you were to do, increase your, your scanning and your attention to the environment by 10 or 20% you've probably helped keep yourself safe from 60, 70, maybe even 80% of the most likely things you're ever going to encounter. Now, if you also know what to look for, if you know how to scan your environment and the people in it, you can take those concentric rings of protection up to 90% plus. There's always going to be a variable that can't be accounted for. Terrorism would be a good example. But for the most part, being alert and scanning and knowing what you're looking for can keep you safe from about 90% of the threats you're ever likely to face. But we have to take your fear down low enough that your brain is able to scan the way it should scan. The other thing I think that happens with people when we start talking about personal safety is they start thinking, well, I must be paranoid. And that's not true either. I don't want you to think just because you've decided to take some steps to provide security and protection for yourself or your loved ones that you've entered the paranoia mothership because you haven't. It's just taking responsibility where you can, when you can, to make yourself a harder target. Criminals and those that would try to make people the victim of a crime are not criminal masterminds. They're opportunistic. They're often cunning, and they do look at their environment differently than the rest of us do. They certainly look at you differently, more of a commodity, either because of something you own or because you yourself. But they're not, as Hollywood would have us believe, these criminal masterminds. They're just cunning. So if you're able to shift your perspective somewhat and look at your environment a little bit differently, more with a mind to, if I was going to get me how would I do it? When would I do it? If you can look at your environment that way, you start to see it slightly differently. You can anticipate some of these areas or some of the times when a criminal might be inclined to target you for something. And that's sometimes all it takes is adopting perhaps a dark mindset where you are looking at your environment from the standpoint of, in the same way that a bad guy would look at it. Oh, I love that, Juliet. Yes. Attention buys you time. I'm going to put that one up. It's true. Attention buys you time and buys you options. And we need as much time as possible. We need really as much space between us and the potential threat as is possible in order to give us time to make a decision, to perhaps put into effect one of the plans we may have at our disposal. We'll talk more about planning in a minute. But Juliet's right. We need as much time as possible. And we get time from identifying the problem as early as possible. Hey, Scotty, good to see you, mate. Glad you're in here. Hi, Carol. Thanks. I appreciate you joining me. All right. Let me jump back in here before I lose my train of thought. I get excited there. Seeing some old friends. Another thing to do that I think helps take some of the fear out of personal safety is to make whatever plans you're going to put in place, even if they're relatively superficial, whatever plans you're going to put in place, do it while you're calm, while you have a clear head. Now, the plans you put in place are the what ifs. If this were to happen right now, I would do X, Y, and Z. And it's to take three, four, maybe five of those for the most likely incidents you think based on your lifestyle and where you travel or, or go to or where your family habitually hangs out, you base your plan around those environments and the people you typically bump into. But you do it while you have a calm, cool head. Because if you can do it while you're calm and cool, it means you have something to go to if the worst were to happen. What often happens when bad things do occur is people go and hit the panic button. Their brain doesn't work as it should once the heart rate reaches a certain level. Cognitively, you're not able to process and think as clearly as you might otherwise. And so a plan is not going to be forthcoming. It's highly unlikely you pull out even a, even a bad plan when under stress. And I'm talking about proper life-threatening stuff. It's really difficult to think clearly. But if you plan ahead and have thought, okay, 
if these three things were to happen, this would be what I would do. And this is what I would go to immediately. You will find yourself able to focus quicker and more smoothly if the worst were to happen. But you've got to put those plans in place before anything were to happen. And it can seem a little bit doom and gloomish to sit there thinking about, well, what if this happened? What if that happens? But it really isn't. And part of the reason that we have fear in the first place when it comes to personal safety is we don't know what we do and we don't know what we're going to face. And you're you're taking the time to just consider some options and think, okay, I'll probably do this if that were to happen, can be enough to help you focus in a crisis and give you a course of action. Will it be perfect? Highly unlikely, because it's very hard to actually imagine and then ultimately experience the exact same thing. There's always going to be some differences. But having at least a couple of plans in place that perhaps, well, maybe this plan and this plan merge for this instance, and now I can move to do that and put that into effect as soon as possible, that's better than not having any response at all to being frozen in the moment and unable to come up with anything clear and and definable for you to do. The other thing that happens is if you do have a plan and there are other people around you and you can initiate that plan quickly, and that's the other reason to have a plan in the first place, it's for speed, other people will follow. They will see this calm, wushu spirit right in the middle of the chaos and go, all right, that person seems to know what the hell is going on. I'm going that way. So you could save more than just your own life if it's really dire, but you you could save many as people decide, okay, I'm going, I'm heading off with that person. They seem to have a half decent plan that's better than what I have at the moment. I'm going that way. So put in place a plan, three, four, maybe five, for what you think would be the most likely instances that you're ever likely to face. Because if you have those in place, you can react and respond much faster than if you try to come up with it on the spot under pressure. So I'm going to jump back in here really quick. I just want to make sure that what I'm saying is manageable because above all else, I think people avoid personal safety or thinking about keeping themselves safe because they think, well, there's just too much. There's too many options. There's too many variables. And so they don't think about it at all, which I think is worse than at least considering a few options. So throw up in the comments if you feel like this is something, okay, I can manage. I can put a few plans in place. I can increase my awareness by 10, 20% if that ultimately results in these concentric rings of protection that I want you to be able to provide for yourself. The other thing that I think can be a bit scary or a bit daunting is trying to predict when bad guys might strike, what are they looking for? So I thought as part of this for my seven various lessons, we should look at, well, what do bad guys ultimately use as a criteria to choose potential victims? If you know that, even if you don't know much beyond that, this is a really good starting point for you in predicting how to not be one of those potential markers or not to be putting up potential signals that bad guys could be drawn to. So how do bad guys choose potential targets? First of all, appearing weaker than the adversary. If a bad guy is looking at you, and let's say, for instance, I'm a short ass, I'm 5'9". Now, I'm a stout 5'9", but I'm still only 5'9". Let's say some guy decides, I'm going to target him. And that has happened to me before, where someone has looked and gone, I figured I can probably outpower them or I can make them a victim, whatever that the plan was. Now, I managed to thwart it. But if somebody's six foot four and 280 pounds against five foot nine, or maybe that same male individual against a five foot three female, they're right. They have the drop on you. They have the size essentially to overpower. But a lot of what a bad guy is looking for comes down to perception. They want to look at you and think, I can probably get away with it. So you can off put that individual by carrying yourself with as much confidence as you can muster. And one of the things that I run into a lot and pass, and this happens when I, I, I'm, I live near a greenway. So I go out all the time on the trail. I do a lot of mountain biking, a lot of running, 
well, staggering, maybe not so much running, a lot of walking out there. And I pass individuals, male and female, and some of them will not hold eye contact. And I mean at all. Like, we'll pass each other on the trail. First of all, they have both earphones in, so they've already shut off one of the senses, which I don't understand. Use all of them, especially if you're in a secluded area. But as we pass one another, they will not look. It's As we pass, it's like this. They fixed on some point ahead of them as if eye contact is going to be the reason why I, if I were a bad guy, would attack. And it's not. Now, do I recommend that you hold eye contact for five, six, seven seconds? No, because that's a challenge and that's the last thing we want. But do I recommend that you hold eye contact for two or three seconds? Yes. But think of that two, three seconds not as a challenge to this in other individual, but as a display of confidence. I'm looking right at you. You can give them a little nod. You don't even have to smile if you don't want to, but you give them a little nod. And that nod is to remind yourself, I'm taking a mental picture of you and I can ID you in a lineup. And sometimes that's all it comes down to. It's your ability and the perception of the other person to go, okay, that person could ID me later. It's not worth it. So even if they perceive that they could overpower and they could get away with it, they're going to have to escalate severely to make you not a witness. And that's a big jump. So you looking and holding eye contact for just a couple of seconds, giving him a nod and going, yeah, I got you on my head. I've taken my mental snapshot. If someone puts a book in front of me now with a bunch of pictures, I'm probably going to be able to pick you out. Even if you really can't in reality, because it's a hard thing to do to memorize all of the features, it at least gives you a chance and it gives the other person the impression that you're confident enough to hold eye contact, which means more than likely you're confident enough to put up a bloody good fight. And the time that I was targeted for a crime, that's what it came down to. It was an assessment period done by the bad guys and they all do it as they were, as he measured up whether it was worthwhile to engage or not. And up to the point where he decided not, he could have. And that's the thing. Sometimes we walk away from an incident or an encounter and we go, I must, I was paranoid. I'm sure that person didn't intend to do whatever. Up until the point where that person does actually initiate an attack, they can change their mind. So you can put them off and looking confident and giving the impression, upright posture, head up, scanning, alert, a little bit of eye contact, or give the impression that you would put up one hell of a fight. And if you put up a hell of a fight, the person's going to move on nine times out of 10, because there's going to be someone right behind you that isn't going to be giving off those same signals. So even though there's a perception that the strong person or the big person can take advantage and exploit the smaller, that confidence, that whole, the old adage, if it's not the size of the, the fight, well, not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog, it's like giving off that energy that you don't want to go here. This is going to get logistically complicated for you if you mess with me. That can often be enough. So a little bit of eye contact and confidence in that way can carry a lot of weight. The other way that bad guys often target is if they feel like they outnumber the individual or the individuals that they're looking at. Now, this is a double-edged sword because we go out with our friends all the time and within our numbers, we feel safe or safer. It's very rare within those groups, unless it's military first responders or something, for them to designate someone to pay attention or for even the whole group to be attentive. Because we feel safe in our group, we tend not to scan as much, which is okay as long as we have a reasonably large group that can hold its own against another reasonably large group. But in many instances, if the large group feels they're stronger than this group, the attack or whatever might happen could still happen if this person or these bad people are carrying tools that they can use as force multipliers, then the numbers don't matter as much. The problem for most groups when we're in these group dynamics is no one's paying attention. And at some point, we as the as individuals within that group are going to leave. We're going to head off to go home. We're going to our car in the multi-level parking lot, or we're heading down the road to go pick up our vehicle or catch a bus or a train or whatever it may be. But we separate from the group. And that's where the whole rules of the wild and wolves comes into play. A pack of wolves will try to separate one from the herd. Same thing. If you haven't paid attention to who's been paying attention to you within your group because you feel secure, 
there's a likelihood or a chance that someone that's decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm getting that person out of that group the first time they separate, they might be successful because you're not as attentive as you could be. And I've got some video I'm going to pull up here really quickly where two people that were essentially where we feel like we're probably safe. But even if, let's say, there's 10 friends and we go down to two friends, if there are four of them and two of you, it's not like Hollywood where fighting back, you know, you pull out your ninja skills and suddenly you're impervious to attack. It doesn't work that way. In most cases, you just get your ass kicked. I hate to say it, but you do, unless you have a force multiplier on you as well. But even if you do carry some sort of self-defense tool, whatever that is, you still need to be alert to be able to get to it, to use it, to defend yourself. If you're not alert, it's just a paperweight most of the time weighing you down. So you still have to be alert and you have to know that if a group of people decides to target you for whatever reason, there is some safety in numbers, but you're better off at the beginning of your evening in much the same way as you would ping one of your group to be the designated driver to stay sober for the evening. Why not ping that same person to be attentive to who's being attentive to you? Even if you happen to be the big gruff guy in the group and you know nobody's ever going to target you because you're a beast. What about the other people in your group? You should apply that that mentality of, okay, I'm going to keep everybody within my little herd safe as the watchdog. You're already sober. Designate that same person to be alert so that there's never a point whenever you go out that everyone in your group is completely oblivious to everything that's going on around them because when everybody eventually disperses, and even if it's a run to the bathroom by themselves, somebody will be alert and aware of what's going on enough to intervene if something were to happen. It really is just changing your mindset a little bit, even if you are in a group and you feel safe. The next big one for bad guys selecting individuals is, are they distracted? And I hate to say it, but once upon a time, all the chemicals in your brain, in your body that were focused or there in order to facilitate your ability to identify a tiger in the grass or a rival village coming in and stealing your food or even you, all the attention we used to have driven by these chemicals to pay attention to our environment and now being hijacked by our phones. And I'm as guilty as the next person. I try to constantly remind myself that just because my phone beeps, vibrates, farts, burps, or does something to attract my attention, I shouldn't become completely immersed in my phone just because it's pinged or something or or has requested my attention. And if I'm going to get on my phone, I'm going to type something, take a call, assuming I'm not wearing my earphones or anything else, I'm going to try and find a place where I can put my back to a wall or a a stack of big shelves where no one can reach in just so I can stay alert to what's going on around me. And then instead of holding my phone down and doing my typing, I hold my phone up so I still have my peripheral vision. These are little things that help give the impression to the bad guys. Remember, they're still in their assessment period to see you differently, to see you as someone that is not a good target because you're still alert. It's the moment your head goes down and they know you're immersed for that for those few minutes in your phone that the potential exists. And you wouldn't think that it would hijack the brain the way it does, but it misses a big white van in the road and walks right into it. 
and this is not just, okay, that one individual on that occasion. This is all of us because we don't have that much horsepower, cognitive processing power available to us at any given moment. Compared to the subconscious, it's next to nothing. So it doesn't take much to distract us to the point where we can miss all kinds of things. And then suddenly you wake up. And of course, after the fact, when you, whenever an attack or something bad happens, you'll always hear from the witnesses, well, it seems it happened so quick. It came out of nowhere. It's just suddenly there was something going on. And then they were all over me or this was going on. The amount and the speed with which these types of attacks happen is often, not always, but often commensurate to the amount of attention that person was paying to their surroundings. And the less attention you have to what's going on, the faster things will seem to happen because you get less warning. Oftentimes it means that whatever's gonna transpire is on top of you, sometimes literally, before you realize, oh, this is bad. And it sounds so obvious in the cool, calm light of day, you think that'll never happen to me, but the world is littered with good people who have had bad things happen because of that mentality. We need to be attentive and not be distracted or be just distracted as little as possible by our phones. And it isn't just so that you don't think I'm beating up on cell phones because I got mine right here. It can be a number of different things that distract us from what's really going on around us, including crazy thing was that happened in a second and he was part of a group behind taking pictures now let me jump into the chat I just want to make sure did everybody see what just happened could you see what happened during those two girls taking the pictures and if you can't say because I'll play the video again I want you to see how quickly this happens and not being alert or being distracted is an opportunity for somebody with ill intent to do something, whatever it is, even if what they've done is only going to pay off later. Perfect. Scotty, I appreciate that. I'm going to play it again because this is the point. We were focused. We were calm. We had plenty of opportunity. And yet, and yet we missed what went on. And we had a very small observational window. This is why we need a little bit more attention to what's going on around us. And at different times, we need to increase that. So I'm going to play that video again. That's how quick that happened. And that, relatively speaking, she wasn't necessarily that distracted. She had hold of a drink, which, of course, is something I'm sure we've recommended to our family or our friends or our kids. Don't let your drink out of your sight. Well, if you're holding the drink but not actually paying attention to it, and how in the world are you supposed to pay attention to that unless you've already planned, okay, well, what if this were to happen? Most of the time, you wouldn't. It's crazy how fast that happened. And she had her drink and he just dropped that little pill in and he walked away. Now, what's he going to do? He's going to watch from a distance until the drug he put in her drink takes effect and then he swoops in. And who knows, maybe her friend and her share a drink and they're both getting some of that drug, whatever is going on, it's going to happen. But it happens really fast. So it's going into certain environments and saying, okay, I'm going to be attentive. And one of the things, one of the things that I think happens a lot of times is people think being attentive is an all or nothing endeavor. And it's not. I want you to think of being attentive like a, an old fashioned dial on the wall. One of those old fashioned thermostats that has the little beveled edges. So it's kind of rough in your fingers and you can feel it. When we're at home, we can dial down our attention to a five. It should never be a zero and it should never be a zero even in your home because many crimes statistically occur 
in or around a mile or a mile and a half of our homes. So we never switch it off completely, but we do dial it down because we want to relax at home. But when we go out to, into certain environments or to certain locations, we should be dialing our attention up. There's this whole area of space that I think people leave open because they think, well, I got to look at everything. And when they look at everything, they get exhausted. Then they stop within an hour. They're too tired to even bother. Or they want to ignore that the potential even exists so they don't look at all. If you were to think about your attentiveness as a dial on the wall that you can dial up and down as needed, you know if you're going to a party where there's going to be lots of people you don't know, that might be a time to dial it up a little bit. You're out for a walk in the park with lots of space around you and no trees to hide. Bad guys, I can dial it down a little bit. I'm still not tuned out to the environment, but I'm selective with when I'm tuned in and when perhaps I'm not as tuned in. That way you can manage the level of focus necessary to stay safe in a variety of conditions and environments. And if you can do that, I'm telling you, it's like it's the, it's the gold that keeps you safe over and over and over and over again, because you can select how much attention you put to the outside world without becoming ultimately too tired to do it. So think of your attention as a, a dial on the wall that you can selectively choose how much attention to use. The last thing that bad guys often use as a way to target individuals is the environment. Now, it could be any combination of the ones we've already mentioned in that the, the attacker thinks they're stronger than you. They think that you are outnumbered. They think you're distracted. So it could be all of those in combination. But it also could be the environment. And by the environment, I mean, where could they hide and quickly ambush, overwhelm, and get away with whatever they have planned? The way to combat this is to, when next time you go out anywhere, look at your environment and go, okay, my best friend is hiding somewhere out there, and they're going to jump out at any minute, like it's Halloween, and scare the crap out of me. And I want to know with, a, with as much certainty as possible, where they might be. Look at your environment and say, where would they jump out from behind whatever to get me? Because when you start looking at your environment from that standpoint and saying, okay, well, if I was going to get me, forget your best friend for a minute, if I was going to get me, where would I do it? You start looking at your environment and the places people can hide completely differently. These are areas that you can't see behind or around, and I call them dead zones because potentially if you aren't attentive to them and someone is hiding there, that is what could happen. So they're dead zones. But you're, the minute you become aware of them and you start assessing your environment and saying, okay, if I was going to hide and get me, where would I do it? You start seeing your whole world differently. You start seeing your world the same way a bad guy does. Next thing you know, there isn't anywhere that they can hide where you're not already thinking, okay, if something were to happen from behind that location or from around that corner or behind that column or that pillar or that tree, you start creating just a little bit more space and you're already a little bit more alert than you were two minutes ago. And that goes then right back to having a little bit more time and a little bit more distance to make a decision over what you're going to do. But first, you want to overlay this blueprint where you look at the environment differently than you have done in the past to see it differently so that you can anticipate the possibility that somebody might be there. We all know the likelihood that somebody really is is probably pretty slim. The likelihood that you are attacked is pretty slim. But the impact of being attacked, not seeing it coming, and the trauma that you would feel after the fact is something that will alter the trajectory of your life or your loved one's lives forever. So it's a very small price to pay to go, okay, I'm going to play a little bit of a what-if game. What if someone were over there or there or here or wherever it may be in order for you to facilitate being able to predict that if somebody were there, I'm going to get my hustle on. I'm going to get my tool out to defend, or I'm going to create massive amounts of space. It's not going to be worth their while. It just changes your perspective enough to make you a harder target. The other thing it does is, let's say someone is hiding behind one of these bloody corners or a wall or a tree, and they see you coming, and they see the attentive scan going on. 
you're not an easy target anymore and there's going to be one right behind you. So they'll most likely wait and choose somebody else rather than making it you. And these are only small little shifts in your perspective that can result in some really big personal safety changes. So Juliet came up and she said, stepped away, press replay. Sorry, I missed that one, buddy. Let me bring it back up. So yes, I'm going to pull it up. There's a video at a party with two girls. So hopefully you caught it, but he dropped a drug into her drink while her attention was on the phone. And this is not at this point, that's not the phone's fault. Yes, we're all going to get, you know, get there and take some selfies and stuff. But it happened so fast that if we're not thinking a little bit about, okay, what if, what if, what if, with a few of these little plans in our head already, it happened so fast. And it's the impact of it can be so long lasting that it's bloody horrible. We don't even want to think about it. The last thing that I want, why I want to talk about here is something that I run in all, all the time. When I go out and I teach personal safety and I do it all over the country, what happens a lot of time, people will say, well, you know, if I, if I don't look at this person, that won't induce an attack or they, they, they are living in the hope that if they beg enough, the person will stop. The unfortunate truth is we should never, as civilized members of society, project our morality, our ethics, or our mercy onto someone that has already, by virtue of what they're doing, displayed and, and through evidence of their actions, displayed that they're not capable of that. You should have a plan in place to deal with whatever you have you encounter as quickly as possible because it's very likely that that person is going to have no mercy, not going to care. You are merely a commodity at that moment, whether it's for something you own or for you personally. So never project that you might be able to, in a worst case scenario, rely on the mercy of somebody else to not do whatever it is they're planning to do. It's hard to think that way because we ourselves would not do any of these behaviors. And because of that, we don't like to think that other people might. And after attacks, often people want to look for a reason or well, how, how did this even occur or what was behind it? What was the meaning? We search for meaning because it's a way for us to validate or maybe apply logic to what happened. But the reality is some people are just bad and they do bad things and they do bad things to good people. Don't rely on the mercy of somebody else. If you end up in a position where, so let's just say somebody wants your car, unless you have a means immediately available to you to deter them, give them your car. It's not worth your life. Let them have it. Cops will chase them down. It probably has a chip in it anyway. They get to them. But if somebody tries to move you from one location to another, trying to take you somewhere, you better have decided in advance, drawn your line in the sand. Nope. This is where this is where the wall is built. This is the Spartan 300. I'm all in. You're not taking me anywhere. If it costs me my life here, yes, that would be awful. But that's better than going wherever the hell they want to take you. Know in advance you can't count on mercy and know in advance what you're capable of doing yourself to defend yourself if necessary. If you have already decided well in advance, if somebody does X, they're going to get a whole bunch of Y, you'll get there faster. And you won't necessarily rely on the tit for tat that we expect to occur when trouble comes our way. I think oftentimes people have this mindset that if somebody pushes me, I'll push them back. If they hit me, I hit them back. Well, an attacker is going to probably come in if it's an attack for you, all in. You've got to be all in and go from zero to 100 in the shortest possible time available and as short as you can manage it. And that takes some mindset changes and a little bit of a feisty attitude, which I know all of you have. It's just that we don't think about that side of ourselves very often. But when we do, when we realize, okay, I do not want to be taken somewhere else because nothing good is going to happen. I'm going to put up my fight here. It's amazingly empowering. It's like, all right, yeah, I've made my choice. And this is where it's going to stop if you can stop it. 
that's better than hoping for the best being taken somewhere else and perhaps as is statistically likely you never been seen alive again and i hate finishing on a bit of a downer but sometimes we have to highlight a little bit of the dark in order to bring light to it and go okay but this is how i'm going to deal with it it's the things we don't know or don't feel like we can know that I think are more likely to be responsible for the fear and the anxiety. When we know what we're dealing with, most of the time we can handle it. We're like, I, I got this. Give me the truth. I'll give you an answer. And, and this is where we sort of find that balance. We also find the middle ground between paranoia of always being on and head in the sand, ignoring that it could ever possibly happen to us because it could. Is it statistically likely? No. But neither is winning the lottery, and that happens all the time. So we want to sort of change our mindset a little bit and acknowledge that, yeah, this is at least a potentiality, and I'm ready if that should happen. I think even if you have all the skills in the world, you can still be caught off guard. Bad stuff happens all the time. It's never the victim's fault. This, The responsibility for what happens rests solely with the person that perpetrates the crime. So even if you're doing everything right, you are attentive, you are clued in, you have a plan and still something bad happens, know that that's not on you. That's not something that is your fault. That's the attacker's fault. That's their individual fault. And your ability to acknowledge and take that on ahead of time will help with the recovery period afterwards rather than criticizing or blaming yourself because you feel like it's something that you possibly did wrong. I was targeted, actually I've been targeted a couple of times, most of you already, because I go into some odd places or I did when I was younger. And I don't consider myself to be an easy target, but people still look to me, well, maybe. And I had my head on a swivel. I was paying attention. And logistically, it's challenging to make me do anything I don't want to do. It still happened. Now, did the person targeting me ultimately follow through? No, because of the other things that I mentioned today giving off that confidence, being alert, being aware, me spotting them early enough for them to go, nah, it's not worth it, I'll wait for the next. But it's never the victim's fault. And if you know that and you've done everything right and it still happens, know in advance that's not on you. That's important because I think it helps after the fact, maybe in a way that many other things might not help. All right, we've covered a lot. If you guys have any questions, throw them up in here and I'd love to answer them before we jump off but I appreciate everyone that's joined for today this has been toppers I hope my goal for today was this to take personal safety take some of the mystery out of it and make it seem manageable that above all else is what I want because when we feel like it's something we can do that it's not overwhelming we're more likely to adopt the habits necessary to make ourselves safe. And if you are scanning and you are alert and you look at your environment a little bit differently and you are in charge of how much attention you pay to your environment at different points, you have probably insulated yourself from 90% of the most likely threats you're ever likely to face. And that's what I want for you. I want you to go into the world and live your bloody life the way you want to live it just maybe slightly differently, just a slight tweak on what you've done in the past to keep you and your loved ones out of harm's way. So if we don't have any questions, I'm going to wrap this up. Cheers, Rob. I appreciate it. And thanks for joining today. I do invite you, now that we've covered all the personal safety again, I've got that out of my system because it is, it is it's a passion for me. I've been teaching this for more than 25 years and every once in a while, I've got to get back on it. I, I need to share this, this, and this, because I think it'll help. We're going to go live again. I'm going to go live again on Thursday at noon Eastern for how your vibe can attract your tribe. How to use video content and specifically your own personality in front of a camera to either grow your business or increase your sphere of influence. So I'm hoping you will join me for that if you're able to. For now, keep your heads on a swivel. Stay safe. Thanks for joining me, and I will see you again next time. Cheers, everyone. Appreciate it.